Uh, Nate, uh, where are we talking to you in Berkeley County here this morning? Yes, yeah, I am actually uh, home today, which is uh, unusual these days. Nate is running for Congress, and uh, where have your travels taken you recently around the state? Uh, we were in Fairmont uh, earlier this week, and uh, and then we'll be up in uh, Moundsville in that area uh, later this week and up in the northern panhandle. So we, we've been doing a lot of traveling. Nate, I can understand for uh, Lincoln Day, uh, Lincoln dinners and the like, uh, but what do you do? How do you gather folks if there's not a special event already scheduled? Well, you know, I've, I've also looked at um, how I can, you know, get out there and, and meet people. Sometimes it's not about politicking, but it's just about getting out and uh, giving people an opportunity to get to know who I am. And uh, so I've done things like gone and spoken about my ancestors who fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, I just did that at a uh, Daughters of the American Revolution. I've preached at some churches and, um, you know, and, and shared my testimony about how God's worked in my life and, and things like that. So it's not always about, you know, getting out and giving a campaign speech. Um, but I've also had, uh, I've had a lot of my volunteers and, and various people who have brought people together in their homes and, uh, you know, I've been come out and, and, you know, speak, you know, about my political campaign and, and what I'd like to do in West Virginia and uh, for our country. And so those are, are really good opportunities. And I kind of like them actually a little bit better than, you know, the bigger events because I get more than five minutes to speak and it's more of an intimate, you know, conversation. And, uh, and I tend to kind of walk away from those with uh, um, volunteers and, and things like that. Are there any one or two things that you've come away with that surprised you that you did not realize that the folks you were talking to were concerned about? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the so there's a couple of things. One was um, my kids are grown, so you know I wasn't really um, aware when I first started running about uh, the issues of parents' rights. Um, that is a huge issue with a lot of people, and it's come up everywhere I've gone, whether it's grandparents about uh, their grandchildren or parents worried about their kids. It is an issue that's important to many people in West Virginia, and I'm talking about specifically the sexually explicit books or the transgender boys and girls bathrooms or the, you know, vaccine um, mandates for, you know, kids in schools where the school's getting to determine, hey, you know, you have to get your kid vaccinated with some experimental vaccine. Things like that are issues that matter uh, to parents in West Virginia. And so that's one of the reasons I got with my with my um, volunteers. And we we wrote a, a piece of proposed legislation and submitted it to both uh, the House and, and the Senate, and we've got um, Scott Hecker, uh, Delegate Scott Heckert has agreed to sponsor it in the House, and uh, and we've got, I think, uh, enough votes in the House to hopefully get it passed the next session, and I've got five different senators that have offered to sponsor it in the Senate, and so you know, it's, a, it's a neat example of, you know, kind of crowdsourced, uh, propo you know, proposed legislation. And so that was something I was not expecting. Um, another thing that has really um, become a, a huge issue out in the northern panhandle, and it was something that I wasn't really even – wasn't on my radar because I've never owned mineral rights. But a lot of the individual you know, private mineral rights owners you know, have major concerns about diminishing royalties and, and, uh, you know, and the fact that they don't really have anybody who's, you know, who's lobbying on their behalf or who's working on their behalf – to make sure their interests, you know, are, are being taken care of. And so, um, so I've met with a lot of people um, who are private mineral rights owners and looked over uh, Senate Bill 694, which passed a couple of years ago that uh, had some, you know, I think it was well-intended, but, you know, sometimes you don't really find out uh, how things are going to impact things until later. And so I think it needs some revision. Nate, was that the forced pooling bill? Yes. Yes. Exactly. And what what have been their complaints or observations of the forced pooling bill that have harmed them? Well, one of the things that um, has been a, a problem is um, uh, language that used to be an and has been changed to an or, and that's you know, having to do with uh, certain things that's allowed uh, the you know the uh, the operators, uh, the gas companies, um, to do some things that have allowed people to have essentially leases that get put into, uh, you know, perpetuity and uh, by, you know, by them being able to, uh, um, 
then being able to basically pull not just the mineral rights owners, but also the operators themselves. And I have some concerns even about that because, um, you know, operator pooling is in a way it's kind of like a, a uh, it, it's, it creates a trust. And of course we have antitrust laws and we don't want monopolies and things like that. It, I think it reduces uh, competition and, uh, and allows for them to, you know, basically get a lease and hold it and then not drill. And then after, you know, it comes, you know, time for that lease to be um, renewed, they can just, uh, you know, basically uh, reallocate, um, you know, a site and, and, and uh, move people around in it. And that's just not, it's not been a good thing, but there's also some other things that are going on too. There's something called the TEPCO um, tariff, uh, which has been applied to a lot of people and the way that uh, it's basically allowing um, the gas companies are, are basically running their gas back down to Texas through this TEPCO pipeline. And so a lot of people are getting hit with um, this tariff, which has caused uh, diminished fees. And, and so instead of the Henry hub being, uh, the standard by which they're pricing um, gas, they're, they're pricing it off of a differential, and that has caused a lot of these diminishes, uh, diminishing uh, returns. So I think um, there's a lot of things that need to be looked at, but I'm beginning to, you know, get educated on this issue, and I've got some really good, smart guys uh, that are helping to educate me on it. And uh, so we've been holding some meetings to, to talk about these things. Now, some of these are state issues. Hold on, Bill. Start over again. I'd have your mind I'm up. sorry. Uh, some of these are state issues, but you're uh, but you're looking at them from a federal sense, since since you'll be running for a state uh, for a federal um, position. Uh, yeah. So I mean, granted, these are some of these are state issues, um, and absolutely, uh, I think the state is where you know the 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 main issue is. Um, and even though it's not an issue that uh, it's something that I would deal with in in Congress uh, at a federal level. Uh, the way I look at it is, you know, kind of taking a, a uh, an example from Donald Trump. You know, before he got elected, he started working on stuff, working on deals, trying to make things happen. You know, to prove to the American people he was willing to work for them. And I, I've decided that, you know, any way that I can use my platform, you know, to help people, even at a state level, um, you know, I'm willing to do that. But at the federal level, there certainly is. Uh, I think there are issues that are related to both parents' rights and also, um, you know, consumer protection and those types of things um, or, or uh, um, property rights uh, uh, protections and things like that that do impact uh, not just people here in West Virginia, but, you know, they, in fact, they, they, they impact people in places like Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Kentucky. So there's a lot of Americans that uh, are affected by, you know, mineral rights. And, and, uh, and there's been some, some issues that I think that have occurred in other places as well. So, but yeah, I'm learning about these issues and doing what I can to help uh, at the local level. And um, there, there's a number of issues that weren't on my, you know, they really were not on my radar uh, when I first started this. And, um, but uh, where I can help, I will. Hey, Nan, I want to get back to the uh, parental bill of rights that you were talking about. Um, <clears throat> we hear a lot about some of the nearby jurisdictions. Loudoun County comes to mind and, and some others mm -hmm. where uh, there are some real issues in terms of, of school book choices and, and what have you. Is that, Are you aware of this happening anywhere in West Virginia? Are you trying to solve a current problem or get ahead of a problem yeah. before it happens? Uh, some of it is getting ahead of the problem. So like in the case of, you know, the, you know, boys uh, in girls shower rings and bathrooms, you know, we want to avoid that. But um, in regards to the books, that is a problem, uh, especially in Wood County. Um, the Wood County prosecutor has refused uh, to follow federal law uh, when it comes to um, decency and uh, um, obscene material, you know, laws that currently exist. They're very explicit on what is uh, legal and what is not legal. For example, um, you know, any kind of artwork, in it, and it's a very specific, any artwork, whether it's drawing, digital, painting, a cartoon that depicts children engaged in sexual activity is illegal. That is not considered art. And yet there are multiple books found in our libraries and, uh, uh, you know, in West Virginia that, uh, because the library doesn't necessarily pick out these books. These books are being uh, sent by the American Library Association 
um, the biggest funders of these books uh, being you know, put into our school libraries and our public libraries are uh, it's uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, it is um, the National Education Association. Uh, it's the uh, American Library Association. So it's a lot of these uh, these unions. And, uh, and, of course, organizations like Planned Parenthood that are pushing for uh, this transgender agenda. And they're trying to, and not just that, but it's also, you know, a, a pedophilia uh, agenda being pushed by these organizations where they're trying to normalize sexual activity by 10-year-olds. And, uh, you know, these things are, are, are absolutely illegal. Uh, they should not be in our libraries. But you've got to have prosecutors willing to prosecute and um and I think we need our own state laws uh, that are you know, a lot more specific about it. So that issue in particular is already in West Virginia. And then there have been cases in where uh, kids have been pulled out of school and have been, uh, or out of class, I should say, and have been um, you know, given counseling about you know, their gender identity and things like that. Um, you know, and the parents don't even know about it. Uh, kids, of course, uh, the other issue that was really big was um, the, the vaccine issue. Uh, I know of at least one case where uh, a gentleman out in Wood County, his daughter, was not allowed to go to school because, uh, you know, he did not want his daughter vaccinated with an experimental vaccine. And uh, and so they he had a big fight, you know, in the courts that he had to, to do in order to, you know, get his daughter uh, back into school. So these, these kinds of things, you know, are really what we're seeing is, uh, something called in loco parentis, you know, being abused by the schools, where it was intended so that the school could do something like call an ambulance if your child is, you know, breaks a leg or something like that. It's being used, you know, to do things that are not, uh, were never intended by it, where they basically are usurping the parents, uh, the parental rights uh, you know, over their children, in, you know, areas of, you know, their right to protect their children, their right to make their medical decisions, uh, you know, even the right of parents to homeschool you know there's some concerns and that's more of a preemptive one but there's concerns that uh you know that the you know that at some later time in the future they could basically say you're not allowed to do that anymore yeah i want to go back to the to the book thing um not surprisingly i'm something of a first amendment purist on these things for the drumbeat from the right has been and and frankly i think correctly so that there's been a lot of censorship of of conservative thought through social media and th and through other avenues, and I I think that's a bad thing. I think I'm, I'm going to guess that you would agree that that's a bad thing. But here we want to sense. But here, but if there's a hypocrisy, is there not? If we want to start censoring other points of view with which the conservatives don't agree, I mean, see if there's any place for schools are about promoting thought and. Why is an idea that is proposed, that is presented in a book, whether it's with pictures or not, um, where is the inherent harm in presenting an idea that can then be evaluated and then accepted or rejected, which is kind of what the First Amendment's about? Well, so one thing we have to remember is that um, the amendments do not apply uh, to children. They don't apply to minors. A perfect example is Second Amendment. Uh, we don't allow, you know, a minor to go out and buy a gun and just, you know, willy-nilly uh, be able to carry. That's just not the way um, that we're set up. We also don't allow for, uh, you know, uh, minors uh, to you know, consent to sexual, um, you know, activity with adults. That's pedophilia, and it's our society has decided. These are things that we're not going to allow. We also have, you know, obscene or obscenity laws that say that you cannot expose children you know, to certain things. Now, if a parent in their own home wants to, you know, uh, explore some book with their child and, and, and you know, show their child, uh, maybe they're a little bit more, you know, um, liberal in their ideology on this. But I don't necessarily think that anybody has an issue with that. What the issue is, is that people don't want their children exposed at the school uh, that they're required to send their kid to to sexual, um, you know, sexually explicit material. We're not talking about sex ed here. Now I'm talking about, um, I've seen these books. When I first heard about it, I heard about it, and I kind of had the same, you know, kind of idea that, that you were just talking about. I am a uh, very much a pro-freedom uh, person. That I think that 
uh, we should protect our liberties, you know, and I do believe in the, the uh, unintended consequences of things sometimes that, that can go wrong. But in this case, I've seen the books. Uh, there are books that are just absolutely, um, uh, they, they are obscene. They have uh, depictions of adults having sex with children. Uh, they have depictions of, of um, you know, everything from uh, oral sex to anal sex uh, to, um, you know, and, and they're, they're depicting this in cartoon form. And I don't think that any 10-year-old, uh, you know, should be exposed to that without a parent's consent. And well, I'm glad books. you brought this up, John Gilstrap. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, the, and these books are in the libraries of us, of some of our schools are are actually in the libraries. Yes, we you, actually. Seen them? This is one of the things that we did when we went down to Charleston because after we wrote this proposed legislation, we went down to Charleston and we set up tables in both uh, rotundas and uh, to you know meet with you know the legislators during the uh, special uh, session that they had a couple of months ago and. We had all the books with us. We had several of the books with us on both tables, and we had the FOIA uh, requests uh, in the inside cover of the books to show what libraries that we had gotten them from and how many copies that they had at these different you know, public libraries in West Virginia. And I, I think it was very effective because, again, until you see it, until you realize that this is actually happening in West Virginia, a lot of people aren't aware, and they don't realize just how bad um, you know, some of these things are. I mean, it is, it is pretty pretty explicit well we've had some folks comment in, on our chat uh uh chat room that says that's uh it's not not that bad it's not nearly as bad as what you're describing um well i, I beg to differ i've seen it myself with my own eyes and so if somebody um now maybe it's not that bad at their public library or at their school library uh, but you know I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, definitely Wood County, it has an, they have an issue with it, and I know there are other places as well. You've mentioned, Wood County, you've mentioned Wood County two or three times. What's the recourse? What's been done now? You say that the uh, prosecuting, uh, prosecuting attorney is not taking action. Uh, what is going to be done in Wood County? Well, what we're trying to do is trying to get this you know, proposed uh, legislation in there so that uh, we can actually you know, have action by the state. Uh, to you know, to basically uh, outlaw this at the state level. That way, uh, you know, maybe the attorney general can do something about it because we do have problems with uh, prosecutors. And I and I understand where they come from. Their their attitude is, hey, look, you know, I don't want to uh, impinge on First Amendment and you know, free speech. And we're not necessarily saying that um, you know that, like I said, that adults shouldn't be able to check out a book. Uh, bringing home their child and, and have them looking at it. But we don't believe that, that this is something where a 10-year-old child should be able to, you know, go into their school library and check out this book, you know, that is, um, you know, teaching uh, certain things that that clearly are, are listed as obscene by the federal government. And so the way we've written it is that we want the federal government's standards to be applied, uh, you know, for, uh, and I, and I'm, to save your audience, I'm not going to repeat the specifics, but the federal guidelines for obscenity are very specific. Uh, it, it lists specific actions uh, that are depicted uh, in these materials. Nate, and it, it flat out says it's not art. Nate Kane is our guest here on the program, a candidate for Congress, and this is the seat that Alex Mooney currently holds. Alex, of course, is running for Senate, where uh, you may have seen some poll numbers recently that's so just a senator... Uh, uh, Governor Justice, well, in command in that uh, poll, at least anyway. Uh, Nate, a request from our audience for uh, something of more substance than a cultural issue, and that is uh, foster sure. care issues in the state of West Virginia, and how, as a uh, congressman, you might be able to help alleviate the issues in the state. So that is another, um, I'm glad you brought that up, or your, your guest uh, um, brought that up. That is another issue that was not really on my radar uh, when I first started this. Uh, but there is a lot of concern, um, and I've heard this across you know the state, everywhere I go, um, both from people who are foster parents and from people who are parents that have lost their children to CPS. And, uh, and I think we need a major overhaul of the uh, child protection system. Um, it is uh, there are definitely multiple cases that I've heard of, you know, personal testimonies from people where uh, they've had their children taken away without any kind of due process. And, you know, we're in a, we live in a country where, 
we are guaranteed due process under the Constitution, and yet uh, it seems that the CPS can take children out of the home without due process. It can be done off of the whim of the you know the uh, caseworker. And the other issue that that I also uh, have heard too is I've heard of people who are um, foster parents that have you know been taking care of children and that uh, have had the children you know after they've been with them for a very long time have had the children removed uh, again uh, without due process and um, so I think it's a real problem. But then on top of that, I remember during the special session one of the issues that came up that they were talking about was that. Um, we had older kids, uh, the harder place kids that were being kept in hotel rooms and motel rooms. And I, I, to me, that just screams a red flag of the possibility of, uh, of uh, sexual exploitation. Uh, I really think that uh, we have to do something about it. Um, one of the issues, and you know, I'm, there's a lot more that I think I need to understand, but one of the problems is, is that a lot of the federal money that comes into this program uh, has worked as an incentive. While, yes, it's helped to provide for, you know, funds for uh, foster families who, you know, graciously, um, you know, are taking these kids into their homes and, uh, you know, need the financial support uh, to do so. And and I support that. Uh, But at the same time, uh, it also seems to, you know, when you speak of these, you know, unattended consequences, uh, it seems to have created a, um, you know, a problem where I've heard stories of, of uh, you know, CPS uh, being involved in in uh, pushing for um, adoptions uh, even when they're not necessary, and you know, and basically uh, because they get a kickback you know, through the federal government. So uh, I think financially incentivizing you know these things, we have to be very careful about thinking about how we can reform uh, the system in order to make it safer. But ultimately, you know, as long as a a parent, uh, even a parent that has their children removed, let's say, because they got arrested for a drug offense, um, if they, you know, the ultimately the goal should be, you know, to reunify, um, you know, the kids with the parent, provided that the parent, you know, has changed their ways. And we don't want to, um, I heard one instance of where a woman um, who was never charged and never uh, convicted of a crime, but she was just simply accused by an ex-husband of doing drugs in front of the kids, which she you know, claims that she didn't, and the kids have never said that they saw her doing that, and yet her daughters were taken away from her, and, and um, she you know, was basically coerced into signing papers that, that she just wanted to get her daughters back that said, if you do all these things, then you know, you'll have visitation, and you know, it'll be um, you know, organized and, and um, supervised, but what ended up happening is it ended up in the family court, and the judge sat on it for nine months, and then he retired. And by the time that everything was done, her children had been away from her for more than two years. And in West Virginia's law, she was stricken from their birth certificates and lost all parental rights. And she hadn't seen her daughter in you know a couple of years. And uh, this was a woman that I ran into in um, Wetzel County. And um, Nate, she broke down into tears. On that, so my wife and I, we just had to, all we could do was pray for her. On that note, we have to end our segment. Uh, how do people find out more about your campaign for Congress? Sure. Um, people can find out about my campaign by going to Nate Kane, the number four, WV.com. That's N A T E C A I N, the number four, WV.com. Thank you for your time this morning, Nate. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Nate. Thanks. Nate Kane. 